Good morning. Good morning. Great to see you this morning. And listen, how good was it to start church with a full room? I don't know what happened there. Maybe someone said something. Um, but it makes a big difference to the atmosphere. So thank you so much. I, you know, we genuinely appreciate the fact that you, you did that. We've crossed the Rubicon on that one. Next challenge, people sitting in the front rows. We're going to break thousands of years of church tradition and sit in the front rows as well. What's happening to us? Unbelievable. Anyway, a, um, just on a personal note, uh, my daughter Lauren, who is our administrator here, which is on maternity leave, uh, went into labour at three o'clock this morning. No, three o'clock, three o'clock in the morning. I said to her, um, she said, will you come over and look after our daughter as, you know, um, when I go into labour? Yeah, we'll drop anything. I said, but listen, not on a Saturday night or a Sunday morning. She's a pastor's kid. She should know how this works. Daddy has to preach the next morning. Three o'clock in the morning. So I've been up since three. So if I sound coherent, incoherent, one, what's new? Two, I've got an excuse this time, okay? I've got an excuse this time. So welcome, good morning in the room, good morning to everyone online. If you have your Bibles there, open them up to John chapter 9, verse 1 to 34. I'm not going to read it up front because we're going to read it as we go. I'm going to try and get through as much as I possibly can. There's huge amounts in this and I had to leave a whole lot out. So John chapter 9, verse 1 to 34, get yourself comfortable set your uh, attention to engrossed and engaged and, and we'll go. Today I want to look at the simple power of your story in a complex world. The reason I want to talk about this is because sometimes it can be pretty hard to be a Jesus follower in today's world. Have you ever found that? You ever found yourself sometimes feeling like you are just out of your depth, you're a little bit overwhelmed by all the tricky issues that we have to seem to navigate these days. What, what do I believe about that thing? What do, I, what do I actually think about that? What sort of stand should I take on this? How should I approach that particular thing? You know what I'm talking about? There's a myriad of issues. And I don't know if I'm just getting old, and that is true, I am just getting old, or really it's a thing, but, but life seems to be getting more and more complicated, right? It just seems to be. Now, I realise young people might be looking at me going, it's just the world. It depends on your reference point, right? I grew up when the milkman used to deliver milk because no one stole it off your steps, right? And you would put the money out there as well. So the world has changed, and I, I'm really dating it, not by horses, he actually drove a car, all right, just, just there. Okay, so it depends on your reference point, but I think the world's getting more and more complicated. Not just the amount of change that is going on the world, but the rate of change as well. It's like, it's exponential, and things are moving so quickly, and sometimes it's just really, really difficult to try and keep up and to keep over everything. Professionally, I subscribe to a whole range of things in order to do that. Um, theologically, um, in terms of my leadership and management and compliance and ethics and uh, technology, you know, I'm always trying to try and keep abreast of the most current things, so I'm, I'm at least aware of these things. And the other day, I got an email from one of these subs things I subscribe to, and it said... If you are not already incorporating AI as part of your daily routine, you are already obsolete. Which I thought was a pretty big statement to make, but it, there was no, it was categorically, you are already obsolete. And I thought, well, that's not very fair because I've only been looking at this for the last couple of months and now you're telling me because I'm not using it every day, I'm already obsolete. But that was the kind of, well, he was pressuring me to do his course, obviously, but that was the thing. But there are sometimes, there are large parts of my day where I, I dedicate to sitting down and trying to do some research and read things and uh, listen to things and try and keep up with as much as I possibly can. And there are days where my head is just absolutely swimming and I'm going through sight after sight after sight after sight. And then after all this research, I usually end up somewhere like this. Little Freddie Tinkles, he's the answer to everything, people. 
sometimes I just find myself going, yeah, I'm just going to watch rubbish on Instagram, okay? <laughs> Maybe it's a romantic, revisionist view of the past, but, but things just seemed simpler back then. I mean, being a Christian's always had its challenges, and we could argue sometimes it was a lot tougher than it is now, but it seems to me that, that there are more and more challenges all the time. And I was having a chat to someone the other day, because I was thinking about all these big, big things that we're facing, living in a, a secular, progressive, um, pluralistic society like ours. It's, 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 it's really challenging. I was having a chat to someone the other day, and he said, oh yeah, um, we had a guest speaker at our church last year, and I don't know whether this was scripted and meant to happen, or whether the guy went off script, but he started talking about gender issues. The net effect of that was 80 people left that church that morning. It's a minefield out there, people, right? It's, it's an absolute minefield out there. So we've got these big issues, but then we've got these kind of more personal issues as well. Not just how do I engage out there, but how do I hold on to my own faith and beliefs in the face of these challenges when sometimes it just seems easier not to. It, it just really does. And I said before that the fastest growing denomination in the West today is that of the nuns and duns, people who simply do not believe anything and those who have given up believing because it just got too hard. And sometimes we feel the pressure that we've got to be all over this, but I would say, do we? Do we have to be all over this? If not, if we don't have to be all over it, what's the answer? And I had some great suggestions back on our how do you want to grow cards? But one thing that came up a couple of times and in conversations with people I've been speaking with recently, one of the things that keeps coming up is, how do I share my faith with my friends? How do I be a witness? How do I talk to people about Jesus? How do I bring this stuff up kind of naturally? Um, it's easy. You're just talking about anything and you go, oh, did someone say Jesus? <laughs> you just copy what they do for KFC and it's like, you're there, right? Okay. No, you don't do that because you won't last five seconds. Okay. The world has changed, but our purpose hasn't. We still exist to inspire people to follow Jesus. That is why we are the church and to bring the kingdom, right? But how we do that in today's increasingly complex world has changed. Just as importantly, how do I not get lost myself in the complexity of it all and hold on to my own faith? And there's a lot to both of those questions and in no way can I cover in detail that all the stuff that this kicks up and, you know, I, and I'm not trying to at all. There's other formats for that and, and other things. But this morning I want to look at this story in John chapter 9 because I think it shows us one simple but very powerful thing and that is this. Whoops, I'm driving this morning. There are always going to be things we don't know but there is something we do know and sometimes that is enough. You with me? Okay. There are always going to be things we don't know, always. But there is something we actually do know and, and sometimes that actually is enough. What is that thing? It's your story. Put simply, it is your story. The simple power of your story is not only a way that you can talk about what you really do know about to others, but what you can talk about to yourself whenever you find yourself getting a little bit wobbly. And how rather than um, when things get challenged. So let's take a look at this story in John chapter 9, because I think it exemplifies this whole dynamic that I'm talking about, where an ordinary guy, he finds himself being challenged about what he believes, about his experience, about his story. And he's challenged by people who are a lot smarter than him, a lot more educated than him, and a lot more powerful than him. And what we see is that rather than just kowtow and, and, and give up, he actually holds his own. He refuses to get dragged into things that he doesn't know anything about. He sticks to what he does know and in the end he actually holds the day. So John chapter 9 verse 1 to 34 and the title is Jesus heals a man born blind. Verse 9, as he went along, uh, verse 1 I think sorry, as he went along he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? So there's a soft start right, they're off doing ministry together and one of the first questions Jesus' disciples ask him is kind of, who's responsible for this? It's kind of uh, 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 along the lines of, hey Jesus, why does God allow suffering and evil in the world? How do you explain these tragedies that happen, right? It's that type of question and 
every age and every culture has its way of trying to understand and explain the world and how it works and why bad things happen and so on and so on. And in Jesus' day, amongst the Jews, it was very cut and dried. It was very simple. It was simply cause and effect, right? It was about judgment and it was about punishment. It, they'd been taught right through all, through all the Levitical laws, all through the Old Testament. It was very simple. If you are faithful and you obey God, you will be blessed. If you do not, you are not faithful and you do not obey God, bad things will happen to you. So when they see things, bad things that have happened to people, that they're lame or they're blind or some other, they've got a disease, leprosy or something, the initial question is, well, whose, whose fault is that? Is that the parents or was that them themselves? Now, it couldn't be that someone just happened to be born blind. Someone had to be to blame, right? Someone had to be to blame. It had to be someone's fault. Now, I'm not going to get into that today. And, and the reason I'm not getting into that is because it's a huge question that's been going on for centuries. And there's a whole field of theology called apologetics which is about us learning how to answer some of these difficult questions. I'm not here to teach anyone about that this morning, all right? So, but just understand, what I'm not saying is, as, we go, as Christians, we go through life and we go, oh, we just don't worry about things because um, they're a little bit hard. We, we actually are able to answer these things, but, but this will take more than what I've got to say this morning. But what I want us to notice is that Jesus does not buy into this argument. He just does not buy into this argument. What he does is he shoots down their premise straight away. Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. Jesus said, this isn't a judgment thing. God, God didn't do this to this guy to teach him a lesson. God hasn't done this to this person to punish him. No, you, you're actually missing the point. And the key word in this, in this passage is so, right? Jesus doesn't get bogged down with the reason this happened because and then gets into all the philosophical, theological or existential arguments about why suffering and evil happen to people and bad things happen to good people, etc. He says this thing happens so. Jesus doesn't worry about the reason, he goes straight to the opportunity that it presents. In fact, in the Greek, there's a word there that's not put in our English um, translations but it, it's like nev- nevertheless and they're like well who did this and why did this happen and Jesus is like don't, don't worry about that okay it wasn't his, he wasn't he who sinned it wasn't his parents who sinned nevertheless this is so we can see God's power in action he doesn't get bogged down in the reason he goes straight to the opportunity I think the message actually puts it really well it says Jesus says you're asking the wrong question you're looking for someone to blame and often that's, that's the reasoning behind some of these questions we get these days. Isn't that people necessarily want to really know the answer, they just want someone to blame, right? You're looking for someone to blame. There is no cause and effect here. And what's he say then? Look instead for what God can do. Look instead for what God can do. This is not a cop-out, right? This is not about saying, hey, that's just way above my pay grade, I can't be bothered. There are times where we need to try and ne- engage in that space. But for the most part, there are times where we're going to feel completely overwhelmed, completely out of our depth. That doesn't mean we have to just sit there, you know, dumbstruck and and just say nothing. We don't get dragged into the reasoning, we look for the opportunity and we look instead for what God could do. What is the opportunity here? What is the opportunity here? I think, the next thing, we don't always need an explanation to make the most of the opportunity. We don't always need an explanation to make the most of the opportunity. So the question is, what is the God opportunity here? What's the real issue that's going on? I think I told you a while ago, back at the end of uh, November and December of 2021, I was going through six weeks of radiation for my cancer treatment. And I'd already wrestled with God about that whole thing and, you know, da-da-da-da-da. But I decided that I'm going to be in this space and in this place... And rather than sit around and feel sorry for myself that I'm here, I'm going to make the most of the opportunity that exists before me in this place that's... I mean, it's lovely people and it's all nice, but it's pretty depressing reason to have to be there. And there are people there for all sorts of reasons and it can be a little bit depressing. So I went into that place every day for six weeks, determined to try and make a difference to someone else in that place that day. And if you were unfortunate enough to sit near me in the waiting room, you might have been sitting there waiting to feel sorry for yourself, but I was engaging you in conversation, right? Not to try and lead them to Jesus on the spot, but to encourage people, to try and give them a little bit of hope, 
to try and make them realise, I know this sucks, right? This is horrible, but, you know, and to talk about other things. I, I think I told you I had the opportunity to, to talk with a lady who was, she was, had a um, throat cancer and the next day they were going to put her on a feeding tube. And I said to her, I'm going to pray that you don't have to go in for a feeding tube. And I saw her the next day and she didn't have to get in for a feeding tube, right? Now, again, that's not... So please, you know, it's not like, don't ask me to pray for you, right? <laughs> most, most of the time it works in reverse, okay? Um, but, but this is what was going on then. So I just thought I'm going to make the most of this opportunity. We don't have to... We don't have to understand why, but we do have to try and see the opportunity in what God is doing. Many years ago, when I was um, in our first year of church planting, some JWs came and knocked at my door, and I thought, come into my parlour, <laughs> said, said the spider to the fly, right? Come on in. Then they used to get in the door, shutting their face, and here's me going, yeah, I'll talk to you. So there was these two ladies and they came into our lounge room and I spent hours talking to them. We actually had a really, really good chat to the point that they said, can we come back tomorrow? I said, yeah, you can come back tomorrow. And they came back three times. And it was to the point now that, that I was really just talking to them about how to become a Christian. And they were like not buying into the whole JW thing. And I said, why don't you come back tomorrow night and we'll, we'll, we'll talk some more. The next night, the knock on the door, it's not them. It's one of the big guns. <laughs> and she's furious. So she goes, I want to talk to you. I'm like, okay, cool, come in. <laughs> you think I'm scared of you? <laughs> anyway, we start having these discussions and the discussions are getting a little more animated and they're getting a little more heated and they're getting a little louder to the point that Heather, my wife, comes in and says, you two need to stop yelling at each other and you need to just calm down and just, you know, oh, okay, fine. So we stopped and we calmed down and I, I looked at her and I said, just tell me one thing, why did you become a Jehovah's Witness? And her whole demeanour changed and she looked at me and there was such anger in her face. She said, because no Christian or no church ever knocked on my door to see how I was. And I thought... You're a J-dub because they cared for you. That's what it was. You know, sometimes we can feel, people can come to us and they can be a little bit belligerent and they can be pushing back on what we think and trying to take, make fun of us or trick us up and that. Uh, and we can get dragged onto their battlefield and we can, we can engage in that sometimes. But, but we need to have the presence of mind and the wherewithal to step back and go... I know that's the presenting issue, but what's the real problem here? What's the real problem? Why the belligerence? Why the adversarial approach to everything? What is going on here? It's like Jesus says, you're asking all the wrong questions. You're getting engaged in all the wrong stuff. Look instead for what God can do. Don't worry about having all the explanations. Look for the opportunity. It's so easy to get caught up in things that don't matter. Anyway, we've got to press on. Verse 4. Jesus goes on and says, as long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. What Jesus is just saying there is we don't have the luxury of standing around and debating all the whys and wherefores in the world when there's actual work to be done, right? It, now, again, there's a time and place to discuss all sorts of issues and problems and stuff like that. But we don't have the luxury of having all that sewn up before... We go and do the things that Jesus has asked us to go and do. Opportunities have to be taken. At some point in the future, there will be nothing that we can do about it. Night will be here. But at the moment, that's not now. We have the opportunity. It's still daylight to do whatever we can to get the best outcome, even out of things that we don't understand. One day, we're all going to stand before Jesus and he's not going to say to us, so what do you think about this? What conclusions did you come to about that? He's going to say to us, what did you do? What did you do? What did you do with the life I gave you? What did, I, what did you do with the opportunities that were presented in front of you? What did you do? I'm not saying we shouldn't give it some thought. We just shouldn't waste our time trying to understand it all and come up with what we think is a slam dunk argument because as we'll see, that doesn't work half the time anyway. 
Anyway, verse 6. This is a bit of a lengthy read, so stay with me because I've had to leave out so much. It's such a great passage. After saying this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva and put it in the man's eyes. Go, he said, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. So the man went and washed and came home seen. His neighbours and those who had formerly seen him begging said, wasn't that the guy that used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was and others said, no, it only looks like him. But he said, no, 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 it's, it's me. How then are your eyes open, they asked. He replied, the man they called Jesus, he made some mud, he put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash. I went and washed and voila, I can see. Where is this man, they asked. He goes, I don't know. Then they brought the Pharisees to the man, uh, sorry, they brought to the Pharisees the man who had been blind. Now the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes with the Sabbath. Now that's going to come into play in a minute and it's a very important part in the argument. Therefore, the Pharisees also asked him how he'd received his sight, and he told them, they put mud on my eyes, and now I can see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God. Why? Because he doesn't obey the Sabbath. But others asked, how can a sinner perform such signs? So they were divided. Then they turned again to the blind man. Well, what have you got to say about him? It was your eyes that he opened. He replied, well, he's a prophet. Verse 18, they still did not believe that he had been born blind. Like, seriously, guys, I've got better things to do. Uh, whatever right and had received his sight until they sent for the man's parents is this your son they asked is this the one you say was born blind how is it he can now see look we know he's our son the parents asked and we, we we know that he was born blind but how he can see now who opened his eyes we we don't know ask him right ask him he, he's of age right he'll speak for himself and his parents said this because they were afraid of the jewish leaders who'd already decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. That's why his parents said, ask him, he is of age. Nice one, mum and dad, throw your son under the bus, right? (laughs) But don't ask me, ask him, he's old enough, he's old enough. But I think that's a really important point there, that dynamic that's going on there, it's a really salient point, because sometimes there is a social and a relational cost to standing up for what you believe. But there is, there just is. Wouldn't it be great if we lived in a world where there wasn't, it doesn't exist. Not, not in this time and place, not until Jesus returns and that all gets sorted out. Until then, there will often be a social and a relational cost to standing up for some things that you actually believe. Now, that doesn't mean that, that we just become professional jerks and alienate people with everything, right? Sometimes I want to say to people, you know, people are, I'm, you know I've just been alienated from everyone and, and people don't want to talk to me because of my stand for Jesus. And it's like, no, it's because of your personality. And it's, the way, and it's because of the way you approach things, you know, you're just rude and nasty. I don't want to talk to you and I'm your brother in Christ, I mean, for goodness sake, all right? So it's not about just being a jerk and, and putting people offside, it's about these deeply held convictions that we have that sometimes we've got to speak up about it and people might go, they're not just going to reject your belief, they're going to reject you and that's going to hurt and some of us have already experienced that. But I want, to see the log- I want you to see the logic in this argument, right? Because it's very much alive and well in our churches and outside our churches. And it goes like this. This can't be true because it doesn't line up with what I believe. Therefore, there has to be another explanation. Now, in their case, it was this healing cannot have happened because this Jesus that you claimed has done the healing, he's not one of us. He doesn't think like us, he doesn't believe like us, he doesn't follow our teachings, he doesn't follow our practices and we know that God only listens to people who are righteous and the people who follow our stuff are righteous, ergo, uh, then God listens to them. He's not one of us so therefore God does not listen to him so he can't possibly have done that. And they were only doing what a lot of us do, reject any explanation that does not line up with my already formed conclusion. Anyone bumped into anyone like that at all? Okay. I will reject any, you know, any explanation that does not line up with the way I see things. Rather than, oh, I might need to rethink. I might, I might need to feed that in and think about this a little bit more. It's just immediately, that's not the way I think and therefore you are wrong. I've got this Facebook friend. I've got a lot of Facebook friends, actually, but I've got a particular Facebook friend. goes way back to my army days. And he is a staunch atheist. But beyond just a staunch atheist, he, he kind of hates religious people, Christians in particular, and loves any opportunity he gets to, to, 
have a go or to find something contentious to, to post, to say, here you go, you know, here's proof that, that Christianity is the root of all evil. You know, he does this all the time. And I never engage, I, you know, I told you I don't. But, but a, a number of years ago, he, he posted something that he thought was a slam dunk, right? It was like, here's what some Christians have done. This just backs up what I've always said about Christianity and it being a load of rubbish, etc., etc., etc. And it was some Christians who, Christians, I'll use inverted commas, right, who had, um, who, who had misbehaved and done some pretty heinous stuff. So I, I could get where he was coming from. But instead of getting into the argument, I said, hey, how you going, you know, saw your post. Um, this is a private message, not a, not, a, not a public Facebook fight. Private message, saw your post. Uh, I just thought, I don't know, you know I'm a Christian, you know I'm a pastor, and I was working at the ReStore at this stage, our missional enterprise out at Seven Hills. I said, um, can I just tell you about my week? And this week I said, one of the things I had to do was go and we, we found a homeless guy um, living under the underpass in Seven Hills and we picked him up and we brought him back and we peeled his clothes and his shoes off and we washed him up and we got him dressed and we fed him and we tried to get him into a shelter but he didn't want to go into a shelter so we gave him a bunch of supplies and we gave him money to get to his next destination. Um, so there was that. We, we did about 15 food parcels for families who were in need um, this week. Uh, we suited up a young guy for his court appearance because he had no good clothes to wear to court. I spent at least a day and a half in court myself as a character reference for some of our community that have joined us there and, you know, for a, a historic crime that they had committed and they have changed their ways and I was there to sort of vouch for them about that. Oh, we helped a, a woman and her children who were escaping a domestic violence situation so we made sure they had plenty of clothes and they were connected up with the shelter and were able to be looked after. And I was helping another young woman who'd had her child taken off her because of her mental illness. How was your week? And there was just silence. And the reason I did that was because sometimes the fruit is the best argument for the root, right? Now, I know it works both ways. By their fruit, you should know them, right? And I would argue this. When people point to these bad news stories about Christians and the horrible things that they do and say, etc., 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 I would question, based on their fruit, whether they're connected to the same root that I am, Right? If your life is not looking like Jesus, if you're not conducting yourself like Jesus, if you're not going through life and people are encountering you like they would encounter Jesus, I'm going to question whether or not you're connected to Jesus. Fair enough? I mean, Jesus said this. Jesus said, this is the litmus test. By their fruit, you should know them. A good tree can't bear bad fruit and a bad tree can't bear good fruit, Right? That's all there is to it. But I say to him, you're right. There are Christians who identify as Christians that do some messed up stuff. But that's not everyone. That's not everyone at all. And I told him just that. I question, sometimes I genuinely question their connection to Jesus when they say and they do these things. But here's the other thing I say. For every bad news story that you seem to delight in highlighting... There are hundreds, if not thousands, of good news stories that you never hear about, which is why I told you about my week. Not to brag, but to show you this is an example of what genuine Jesus followers, what it looks like. And this is just my story. But there are hundreds and thousands of these stories every week. Because sometimes the fruit is the best argument for the root. You want to call into question my beliefs? You want to tell me it's all rubbish and that it leads no place good? Explain my life. Explain the decisions I make. Explain that thing that those people over there, those Jesus followers over there are doing. Don't just ignore it, okay? You're always picking on the bad things that Christians do. Why don't you look at some of the good things and tell me how it works? And that's what this guy does. He argues that the fruit should tell them all they need to know about the root. Verse 24, he says, a second time, they summoned the man who had been blind. Give glory to God by telling the truth, they said. We know this man is a sinner. Verse 25, he replied, whether he's a sinner, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. He says, you guys want to argue theology? That is just way above my pay grade. 
But let me tell you my story. Let me tell you what's happened to me. I was blind and now I see. Problem belong on you. You need to explain that to me because you've already told me that it's impossible. You've already told me that this Jesus is not from God. So technically, this could not have happened. The, the, the difficulty I have with that is I couldn't see. <laughs> now I can. So you are going to have to explain that one to me. So we don't have to be drawn into battles about things we don't understand. We just have to be able to talk about the things that we do understand and that we do know. And that's our experience and our life. And I am assuming that if you are a follower of Jesus, he has made a big difference to your life and continues to make a big difference to your life. So you should have something to talk about. If you haven't got something to talk about, maybe go back to Jesus. We should all have some version of, I was, but now I am. It doesn't have to be that dramatic, right? I know we love the big testimonies about, you know, I just got out of prison, I was a gang member, I was a drug addict, and now, yeah, great. But not all of us were gang members. I was just an idiot, <laughs> right? I was just a garden variety, garden variety idiot. Still am in many respects. But I'm being healed of that, right? I don't have any dramatic conversion story. I came from a, a non-church family. I didn't grow up in church. I'm, I'm from the pagan pool. I got saved at 19. So, okay, we don't have to have these big... But we've got our own stories. I was, but now I am. There's a lot to talk about there. Anyway, I've, I've got to press on. Verse 26, and they asked him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? Man, this guy's like, we've done this, right? We've done this. I've told you and you don't listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? <laughs> oh, boom. Like what? Dude, you know. So they hurled, <laughs> I love this, right? They hurled insults at him, right? Yeah, I know what I am. What are you? Ha, ah, you know, right. So, so you are this fellow's disciple. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but as for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. The man goes, that's remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. He just spins their logic back on them, right? We know that God doesn't listen, listen to sinners. He listens to godly people, right, who do his will. No one has ever heard of someone opening the eyes of a man born blind. So if this man were not from God, he could do nothing. I love it. Right? He just, he just like, he slips him that. Do you want to be his disciples too? Like, whoa. And then he, he just goes, I'm going to use your own logic back on you. You think he's a sinner. You say God doesn't listen to sinners, right? And yet here I am healed. You need to explain to me how this works. Man, that is not a bad approach. That is not a bad approach. Not getting drawn into things we don't understand, but saying, you maintain that this is a whole load of rubbish, but let me tell you, I once was, but now I am. You explain that to me. You explain why I see things differently, why I approach life differently, why I am this person now. You explain that to me. To this they replied, you were steeped in sin at birth, how dare you lecture us, and they threw him out. Now, that's how you, that's how you win an argument in the end, right? People aren't seeing things your way, they aren't coming around to your way of thinking. Insult them and throw them out, right? That settles it, doesn't it? Okay, I won. All right, yeah, really grown up, Pharisees, really grown up. But listen, again, it's a very salient point. This guy is talking about something, some profound experience that he'd had, a measurable experience. It wasn't something just subjective that I was sad and now I'm happy and they couldn't measure that. I was blind but now I see right? He's had this powerful encounter with Jesus and now he can see. But not everyone is going to believe our story even if it's that obvious. This is it. Sometimes people are so wedded to their way of seeing the world, wedded to their, their already established conclusions and feelings about things, that it wouldn't matter if you rose from the dead 
And in fact, we've got kind of a bit of a story there in the New Testament, don't we, where it's people are like, Jesus rose from the dead, I don't, I don't care, I still don't believe it. Okay, well, you've got an empty tomb there, that's going to have to be your problem, right? <laughs> Some people are not going to believe our story. Some people are not going to rethink their position. Not everyone is going to go, wow, that was wonderful. We are going to still be rejected. Most people will probably dismiss it completely. And, as I said before, not just our story, they will dismiss us in the process. And the reason I say this is not to be a downer, but for us, if we were serious about sharing our faith with people, we need to manage our expectations about what that could look like. Now, this is not lack of faith. This is just reality speaking. I believe God can do anything. I believe he can do the miraculous. He can get through the hardest hearts. He can get through the people who, who are the stubbornest people, the, the people farthest from him. God can reach all of them. Are you hearing me say that? But I see so many people who get disheartened and dis, disillusioned because they've taken the step of sharing their faith and something miraculous didn't happen immediately. They go... It's not working. It doesn't work. No, you need to manage your expectations around this. Sometimes this is a long process. Sometimes this is a difficult process. Sometimes this is a really hurtful process. There used to be this thing many years ago, they used an evangelism called the Engel Scale. And it went from minus 10 to plus 10. And what it measured, and this is not science, right? But how far someone was from God. Some people are at minus 10. One or zero is where there's an awareness of God. Some people are starting from minus 10. They're that far away. But there are lots of steps they need to take to come to zero. Not everyone is going to hear our story and go from minus 10 to plus 10. It doesn't always happen like that. It can, but we need to manage our expectations around that. There is no technique, there is no method... There is no secret source. It is a long, nuanced process. And you should understand that. It is a risk. It requires vulnerability. It takes resilience. And above all, you need to remember, it takes God to open people's eyes, not our slam-dunk arguments, right? It is God who remo removes the veil from people's eyes and opens their eyes to the truth, not our clever arguments. But beyond that, it's going to take your story, your story. I mean, Paul says to the Corinthians, when he needs some, he's talking about needing references or something, he says to the Corinthians, you are our letters. Your lives are the testimony to the work of Jesus. We, our lives, are the letters of endorsement. They are the letters that prove the work of Jesus. So I'm assuming that if you want to share your faith with your friends that you've got a story worth sharing, that you're living the story. Again, it doesn't have to be dramatic, it doesn't have to be blind, but now I see. But it should be a story about how Jesus has changed your life and continues to change your life. It should be a story that says, there's, there's, there's a whole lot I do not know, but this I do know. The more I follow Jesus, the more compassionate I become. The more I hang around with Jesus, the more generous I become. The more I try and follow Jesus, the more loving I become, the more gracious towards stupid people I become, okay? I'm learning to forgive, I'm learning to be more expansive. We don't need to know how to answer every question, but we do need to know the difference that Jesus is making in our own life. And not just so we can talk with other people, so sometimes we can talk to ourselves and remind ourselves of what is real and what he has done in our life. At those times when it gets a little bit challenging and a little bit hard and sometimes we feel wobbly, so we just have to tell our own story. The Old Testament is full of that stuff, where they would find themselves facing really testing, challenging, trying times, and they would say to themselves, where is God in all of this? And they would raise their fists and they would, I don't get it, I'm not sure if this will work. And then they'd say, but then I remember. And they would remember everything that God had done for them in the past. And it would bring them back to that place of, yes, it's trying, but it's true. So what's your story? What difference has Jesus made in your life? What difference is Jesus making in your life? And if you can't answer that, what are you going to do about it?